Hi there. Thanks for taking the time to come check out this video. It's of a talk that I gave to update my dissertation committee about the research that I've been doing. In this video, I discuss a paper that I wrote with my advisor, as well as talk about some interesting connections between our work and the fields of convex optimization and conic geometry. In particular, I discuss how it is possible to come up with the idea of an effective state space dimension for a quantum system by thinking about cones in the quantum state space and computing their so-called statistical dimension. Hope you enjoy. So for those of you who are new to the whole Travis gives a talk sort of thing, you're welcome to provide feedback in person via email, or you can tweet at me. <laughs> I, I totally welcome that. No. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, ready. So Be originally, sure. this talk was going to be about a paper that Robin and I wrote, and we posted on the archive in September, entitled Behavior of the Maximum Likelihood in Quantum State Tomography. It's a really great paper. I encourage you to go check it out if you think about state tomography. We've also put the source code for the paper and the data files necessary to make the figures in the paper up on GitHub. So if you're into this whole reproducible science thing, you can go check it out there. Uh, and you can also open an issue on GitHub and let me know if there's a typo or something like that. And at this point, I'm anticipating adding an acknowledgement to every person that does that. So there's thus incentive to go do this and help us make the paper better. So, you know, as of September, the talk was mostly just going to be about this paper, and we were going to walk through its results and go through all of its calculations, and I was going to tell you why it was super useful and important. Instead, what we're going to do is we're actually going to pivot to something completely different. So about a day after the, the paper was posted, I received this wonderful email from a graduate student in Cologne, Germany. He said, Travis, your paper is so great. Everyone should go read it. And guess what? This thing that you calculated, it's got some wider application than what you think. Because you computed this thing called a statistical dimension of some kind of cone in quantum state space. And guess what? People use these statistical dimensions to prove things in classical compressed sensing. So ever since September, I've been engaged in furiously attempting to understand all of the literature related to these topics, which you've heard me present about at the archive review meetings. And so the purpose of this talk is actually to explain this new context through which we are interpreting our work. And broadly speaking, the question that we're trying to answer now is how does the geometry of quantum state space affect resource requirements for state tomography? At this point in the talk, resource requirements is going to be a very kind of broad, hand-wavy phrase that I'm going to use. Think of it in terms of computational complexity or time or number of experiments. So I need to introduce a little bit of jargon and terminology to get us up to speed on this. And I'm going to start by observing that if you asked a statistician what a density matrix is, they would tell you it is a statistical model. Why? Well, suppose I have some density matrix rho. Then from the Born rule, if I have some POVM that I'm measuring, then that density matrix maps onto a probability distribution over those measurement outcomes. And since different density matrices give rise to different probability distributions, these probability distributions are thus a parameterized family of probability distributions, aka a statistical model. So in this talk, when I use the word model, what you should think of is sets of density matrices. Okay? So this is kind of a, what's called the forward problem in statistics. If I have a state and I know my POVM, then I can predict the probabilities of measurement outcomes. <coughs> state tomography is what statisticians would call the inverse problem. So as a theorist, I'm going to assume that I have access to some data set, so perhaps a collection of measurement outcomes and the number of times that measurement outcome was observed. And what state tomography as a thing is supposed to do is take that data set and then map it to an estimate of a quantum state. Now, a word on notation here. Normally, we would read this notation as the operator row, but statisticians like to put hats on things in order to indicate estimates of them. So this is an estimate of the state row, okay? Now, as people commonly do it, state tomography is actually very resource intensive. And so I'd like to take a few examples to show you what I mean by resource intensive. So a good example, and, and I think a, a nice one, is this paper uh, from Reiner Blatt's group in 2005, in which they were attempting to characterize entanglement in devices that they were producing, in part by simply reconstructing the state that their device was making. And comparing that state to this, uh, this so-called W8 state, the, the maximally entangled W states. And so if you go read that paper, it's, it's very cute because they observe that in order to do this tomography on just eight ions, it required them to run almost 656,000 different experiments. And in order to do all of those experiments, it took them 10 hours of runtime. Now, I don't know if 10 hours of time in the lab is a lot or is a little. As a theorist, it's bigger than one. 
So therefore, we're like, okay, this, this is a lot. What's also really interesting is that if you read some of the papers which follow from this paper and reference it, there's kind of a lore that has built up around this work. And in particular, uh, later papers say that actually it took weeks of data processing in order to produce the estimates. Just think about that. You were in the lab, you did 656,000 experiments, you took 10 hours of your life to get that data, and then you had to let a computer sit there and crunch on the numbers for weeks. And what do you get out of it? This plot. Now, admittedly, this plot is kind of cool. You know, it's got some absolute values of density matrix elements, and you're supposed to look at this and say, God, this thing looks like the density matrix element of this W8 state. A lot of resources for just this picture. Something a little bit closer to home is gate set tomography that we've been working on over at Sandia. So if I want to do a complete black box characterization of a single qubit, I might need something like 2,700 unique experiments. More specifically, we're using this long sequence GST with a germ length of roughly 256. Now, admittedly, again, I don't know how long it takes to do 2,700 experiments, but it's still a number that's bigger than one. Recently, we've started working on two qubits, and in order to do Q qubits, Q, ah, excuse me, two qubits at much less accuracy, it still requires 1,600 experiments. And if you go read the commit history for our open source code pigsty, when we initially built two qubit GST, we found that it was actually chewing up all of the memory on the computers that people were running it on. So very compute intensive problem that we're trying to deal with here. Now, thankfully, I, I do have to give a shout out to Eric Nielsen, our developer, who's managed to use MPI to beat that runtime to, to minutes using multi-core processing. For those of you who've taken Ivan's quantum optics course, you might appreciate this example. So this nature paper from 1997 uh, from Breitenbach, in which, what is this thing? Quantum optics people? It's a Wigner function, right? So they wanted to uh, write down this Wigner function, or at least make a plot of it. And I was reading up some about this, because you know I took Ivan's, or audited Ivan's course, and wanted to think about this a little bit. And in order to get that Wigner function, you take this kind of data, these quadrature amplitudes, and you apply something called the inverse radon transform. You should have done the homework, Travis. I should have done the homework, too, and then I would have really, <laughs> really you understood. would have done that. Yeah, you would have done that. And because you did the homework, you know that doing the inverse radon transform involves an integral over all the quadrature angles. What that means is that if you only measure a finite number of quadrature angles, then your reconstruction, right, only instead of integrating over all theta, some finite number of theta, that introduces artifacts into the reconstruction. And so here the resource would be, well, technically, in order to get the most accurate estimate possible, you'd have to measure an infinite number of quadrature angles, which nobody ain't going to do that. So I think these examples do show that state tomography, as it is practiced, is very resource intensive. More specifically, it can be time intensive in terms of the number of measurement outcomes that we need to use, or in terms of the amount of time that we have to let some poor graduate student sit in the lab and make sure that the experiment finishes. Then once you collect all of that data, you might have to go use one of these supercomputers and let it crunch on the numbers for a while in order to get an estimate. Now there are many reasons why state tomography is resource intensive. The one that I want to kind of focus on here is simply the number of parameters that you have to fit in your density matrix. So a good example of that would be multi-qubit tomography. So suppose I have a single qubit and I want to write down an estimate of its state rho hat. Well then I need to specify P equals three real numbers in order to fully specify that estimate. Again, a word on notation here. Statisticians use the letter P to denote number of parameters, which is a convention that I'll maintain in this talk. Now, if you scale up to larger and larger uh, system sizes, what you discover is that the number of parameters that you need to fit, naively you say, God, God, this thing blows up exponentially. The number of qubits, I know I'm working on my column question, so that way when I leave, I can spread the good word. And computer scientists tell you that, that anything that grows exponentially is just a bad idea. And so how is it that we're gonna go about actually doing tomography of you know, a few qubit systems? Well, one saving grace is that even though state tomography, as we kind of naively practice it, one could say, is very resource intensive, if you impose additional structure on your models, then you can get by with fewer resources. And so we're gonna pivot to a particular kind of structure that people use in the quantum information community, namely some, saying something about the ranks of your estimate. So for example, suppose my model is, I'm only going to report an estimate that is a pure state. So this uh, structure up at the top here. Well then, the number of parameters that I need to specify is only two times d minus one. And in general, if I impose a structure that my state is going to be rank r, 
Well, then I need only r 2d minus r minus 1 real numbers. I got to give a shout out to Jonathan Gross for <laughs> alerting me to the existence of this number, which uh, I didn't know about. Now, if you read Ivan and Amir and Charlie's work, they'll tell you, well, you, you know, these sets, sets of rank R matrices, are not convex, which means that you can't just naively use some convex optimization routine to impose this structure. So one way that people have dealt with this is through something called quantum compressed sensing, where the idea is we want to choose a particular POVM, such that by minimizing or by solving a particular convex optimization problem, then I can return an estimate that has low rank i.e. I can impose this structure in a convex way. So if we go look at that paper uh, by David Gross and et al. from 2010, the basic idea is as follows. What we're going to measure is we're going to assume we have an n qubit system, and we're going to measure the expectation values of tensor products of poly matrices. Once I have that data, I'm going to solve a particular convex optimization routine, namely nuclear norm or trace norm minimization. This is, you could think of this as the convex relaxation of saying minimize the rank because this quantity is simply the sum of the eigenvalues for Hermitian matrices. The only constraint that we impose is that the, the expectation values that our, that our estimate predicts, or excuse me, that our, expect, that our estimate predicts for the data we observe are consistent. And once you have those two assumptions, then what you're able to show is that there's a sufficient number of measurement outcomes <coughs> to ensure you have unique recovery i.e. the estimate that is returned by solving this convex optimization routine is actually the state itself. And so this is a very nice bound. And this bound is less than the number of measurements that you would naively need to use. So what compressed sensing is trying to do is say, well, if we find these particularly nice POVMs, then we can, say, then we can use these kinds of convex optimization routines in order to use a, a fewer number of measurements. And uh, this work has been extended by Ivan and Charlie and Amir in terms of classifying POVMs in terms of this so-called uh, strictly rank R complete property. I was just yes, make one very, it's a kind of a nitpicky sure. point, but these actually aren't POVMs. Those are, those E's are That's not a positive thank operators. You, thank you. So they're yeah. not, they're actually, but they are, what they do do as is correct in, in this, what you say is correct. They prove that expectation values of Pauli's no, that's R, RIP, and they right. then use right. that to prove this. But, These themselves, but, but, yeah, but yeah, yeah, Amir yeah, yeah. showed that right. if you looked at the POVMs that correspond to uh, the measurement outcomes, that that too was RIP. Okay. And it was just a slight looking at extension to this. Okay. Just, no, no, just well, a minor you. point. It, it, it's good to clarify these kinds yeah. of things. Well, it, what we're going to do is we're actually kind of going to ignore all of this, though. That's fine. <laughs> in part because, you know, in the abstract of my talk, which I assume you all read, I say something about the popular maximum likelihood estimator. So let me specifically focus on what can we say about the resource requirements of maximum likelihood estimation when we have positivity. Now, Ivan will tell you about the paper that, the papers that he's written in which they say uh, maximum likelihood plus positivity is quantum compressed sensing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take kind of a complementary tack to the work that they've done and show how you can kind of get this compressed sensing results because the local geometry of the state space that you're trying to do the estimation in has some nice geometric features. So what the heck is this maximum likelihood estimator? <coughs> well, being a state tomography protocol, it simply takes some data set and it maps us to some estimate. The way that this estimate is computed is we have to first compute this thing called the likelihood function, which is simply the probability of the data set that we observe, you know, given this state, Maximum likelihood goes all the way back to Fisher classically. Uh, we've seen it in quantum information uh, from Prottle in uh, about 1998. And the maximum likelihood estimator simply says, return me the state which maximizes this quantity. Okay. Now, in order to say a few things about the resource requirements when we use maximum likelihood, there are a few assumptions that we're going to make, specifically three. The first assumption that we need to make is something <coughs> called local asymptotic normality which asserts that our likelihood function is going to look like a Gaussian. So there's one small technical thing we're going to do here, is we're going to talk about likelihood is probability of data given state. I'm going to think about that instead of um, having access to some estimator, rho hat, which summarizes all the information in that data, i.e. rho hat is a, quote, sufficient statistic for that data. So I'm going to move away from probability of data given rho, and I'm only going to talk about probability of rho hat given rho. Under the, these local asymptotic normality assumptions, this probability has this form. Where this Could matrix I here. Ask about what the assumptions 
assumption? That, that is the, this is, this is the assumption. I understand, but yeah. is that true asymptotically or is there an assumption? It is not true asymptotically for state tomography. Hmm. When the state that you're trying to do this inference on is on the boundary of the model that you're estimating at. But otherwise, yes, it does hold. Yes, Robin. Well, otherwise, it takes in a hell of a lot of ground. You, because it, I'm asking about this because it's a subtle point that there could be confusion. Right. You've said row hat here right. should be an estimator that is a sufficient statistic. Right. So two questions. One, do we know that such a thing exists? And two, if we wanted an example, uh, would the maximum likelihood the estimator, maximum likelihood estimator, estimator, estimator example? would itself be an example of such an estimator that would be a sufficient statistic? So one way that you, basically, this is going to talk about distribution of unconstrained maximum likelihood estimates, and then we're going to talk about imposing positivity as yet another assumption. So I th we'll bring this up later, but okay. I think the unconstrained is. The constrained would not be a sufficient statistic. Right, 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 exactly. So unconstrained maximum likelihood, but we don't impose positivity. Th this will this will always hold. This will always go through. No problems. That's right. sort of what I was asking. Right. Okay. Although, how do you know it's I, I in the trace room? You mean why is it the Fisher information? Oh, oh I is the Fisher. I is the Fisher information. I know. <laughs> we can just develop a dictionary of consistent notations across CQIC at some point. I didn't know what I was. That's fine. Because we're actually going to change it, right? We're going to assume that the Fisher information is proportional to the Hilbert Schmidt metric, i.e., it, it's basically proportional to the identity. Okay, so the identity is that other goofy thing. The other goofy thing is the identity. This is Fisher information. This stands for probability. You know, are, are, is it now all clear? Finally, we need to impose positivity. So naively, if we try, if I said, okay, here's my likelihood function. What is the maximum likelihood estimate? We'd say, oh, well, that this quantity is minimized when rho is equal to rho hat. But as I just said, rho hat is supposed to represent this unconstrained maximum likelihood and thus might be a, non, a, a negative matrix. And so therefore, when we're doing maximum likelihood, we have to search over this set of density matrices and minimize this Hilbert-Schmidt distance. And it's actually precisely this assumption that makes this the LAN assumption break down when we talk about so-called constrained maximum likelihood. So once we have these assumptions, what, we're, what are we going to study? We're going to so, study, so Travis, yes, Carl. Just, just interrupt again, so I'm of sure course. I know what the assumptions are. Yes, go back I will go back one slide. That's very impressive. That you can go back to a body of work on this. <laughs> 21st century technology. Anyway, uh, so the first thing isn't really a it is asymptotically that's the facts. Mm -hmm. The second thing is an assumption, and it's not really even an assumption, it's just wrong. Right? It is it is just an assumption. Oh, assumptions right. are what they are. They can I they are neither absolute one. square to I. Ever. That's or fine. That, that's okay. I can make I, that I assumption. Know, so it, it's it's more than an assumption. It's an attempt to make the thing trackable. If you want to look at it that way, that would be a good way of looking at it, yes. That is, you can't make any sort of progress on this problem without making this assumption. It's also an assumption people make in a lot of other contexts, too. And classically, if we're doing inference and there are no boundaries and we don't have to worry about the fact that land breaks down, then you can always execute a coordinate transformation such that that's true. But you can't always do that. But you here. could look at this in a slightly different way, where you don't have to make any assumptions and where the maximum likelihood it is actually with no further assumptions, is actually the, un, you know, will be the unconstrained likelihood, maximum likelihood for a Gaussian. <laughs> by not calling this row hat, by saying, but actually doing it with respect to the data. So I could say, minimize the distance between the uh, you know, the probability to see this outcome with a given state and the data I receive, rather, and then return row hat to be that. So I think the canonical example, and Robin always tells me in this yeah. case, is uh, I do qubit tomography, I measure each of the poly, uh, project yeah, onto the sure. eigenbases of the poly matrices, and I observe plus one. Mm -hmm. So then my maximum likelihood estimate is the corner of the cube which circumscribes the block sphere. And that's, but I'm that's, saying that's asymptotically, okay, that's, you know, that's to the degree to which 
I say I have asked that my likelihood function, so the probability of the data given rho will asymptotically be a Gaussian if I parameterize it in, as if I call the data, say, the frequencies of outcomes of certain. Mm, from the way that Robin is looking, I think that there's a, a deep and subtle argument that can take place at a later point. Okay. Now, are there any other questions on the sets of assumptions that we're making, or, there, or can we get on to the analysis? But I, I mean, I'm not going to be sworn on it because, of course, we want to make the same assumptions. Exactly. We are equally wrong, Carl. It's a great place to be. Partially, I'm just looking, seeing how you wiggle out of this, so we can wiggle out of it ourselves. I, I believe that, that transparency, <laughs> radical transparency, is but always the best. I don't see any is a classical Fisher matrix. Yes. Yeah. It depends on what row is. Yes. A function of row. Yes. And it is almost never. And it is almost never. And we will make that assumption here. And we will derive beautiful results and have very wonderful graphs to show you. Yeah, I mean, but there'll be a covariance matrix. I don't know why it has to have all have the same eigenvalues. It, does, it doesn't have to, in general. We're making that, that assumption to yeah. simplify the analysis. OK, got so it. So that way, we can talk about what is the average number of parameters in a maximum likelihood estimate. Mm -hmm. This is the quantity that we're going to study. Now, you might say, well, why the expected value? Why not just compute the probability distribution over the number of parameters itself? Well, because that's hard. Right, so we have this distribution of unconstrained maximum likelihood estimates. We have a, a constrained maximum likelihood estimator. That'll distort the distribution of estimates, and therefore, it's just really hard. So we're not going to do that. What we can do, though, is we can say something about how many parameters do you need, uh, on average, in maximum likelihood when you impose positivity. Yes, we can do it. To answer that question, though, we're going to have to think about cones for a little bit. And this might now explain to you why I've been talking about cones for the past, like, five weeks or something. So classically, a cone is simply a subset of a real vector space, mm -hmm. such that every positive scalar multiple of a vector in the cone is also contained within the cone itself. So pictorially here, these two black lines are supposed to represent the edge of the cone. The place where they meet is the vertex of the cone, and the white space in the middle is you know, the cone itself. We'll define a cone in quantum state space. Robin won't let, let, yet let me call it the so-called quantum cone, but we'll get there eventually, okay? The quantum cone, okay? Suppose I have some state rho naught. I will define a, co a local cone around rho naught as simply the collection of all directions I can move in my state space, such that if I take some kind of step in that direction, I am still uh, a valid quantum state. Now, so, down on the boundary, that isn't going to be you're going to be able to go both directions. So there, there, are, there are many high-dimensional boundaries that we're talking about here, Carl, and I am just a lowly three-dimensional being, and I'm using a two-dimensional representation for visual clarity. I could have been wrong on the cone. I just made that up. Okay. So again, you know, the vertex of the cone is going to be this thing, rho naught. The edges of the cone denote the black lines, and I'm using the gray shading to denote the inside of the cone. Yes, Rob? Let me follow up on Carl's question. Yeah. Suppose that I have a full rank state, rho naught, that's in the ball. Yes. Is the local cone defined as you defined it, the, the, you know, the set of all directions you can move, is it a cone? Yes. It is definitely a cone. Now, there are two concrete examples that I can draw for you. If we zoom in locally on the quantum state space, we actually discover such cones. So I'm going to take a slice through the block sphere, assume that my state rho naught lies on the boundary. Then when I zoom in locally, what I get is a cone that's called a half space. Because there's half the space locally, I can move into that direction. Half the space, I cannot move out. As Robin pointed out, if my state is in the bulk, then gosh, I can move in every direction I want. I have complete freedom. And this, this sort of full space is also a cone. It's not the kind of cone you normally think about, but it does, in fact, satisfy the definition of a cone. So why are we talking about cones? Well, because cones have this thing that we can compute about them called the statistical dimension. As I mentioned last week, the statistical dimension of a cone tells us what kind of real vector space a cone behaves like. So my cone C behaves like a real vector space with dimension given by the statistical dimension, which I'm denoting by delta. Now, this definition and this intuition makes sense because if the cone is actually an L-dimensional subspace of whatever vector space it's inside of, then its statistical dimension is, in fact, L itself. And so that, that's why people in convex optimization use this kind of intuition when discussing what is it that the statistical dimension of a cone is actually telling us about it geometrically. Now, there is the small problem that this quantity is not necessarily integer value. 
So we're going to have to kind of think about in what sense does it make sense to say that this cone behaves like a real vector space with dimension 2.5. It's a good point. For cones in the quantum state space, we could obviously just also compute their statistical. We could also compute their statistical dimension. I don't, there's no justing apparently in this uh, in this year's seminar. So the quantum, these cones in quantum state space, we can also compute their statistical dimensions. And kind of the, the question that should be sitting in the back of your mind is, well, you said average number of parameters in maximum likelihood estimation, so where the heck did that thing go? It's right here. What we kind of like to develop some intuition and ideas about, and what we have been doing, is understanding how this quantity tells us about the average number of parameters in maximum likelihood. And one way that you can see this is because my maximum likelihood estimates are going to be kind of some distributed somewhere around here, around this true state. And so the geometrical properties of that cone then constrain the geometrical properties of maximum likelihood. And this statistical dimension quantity does in fact tell us something about this quantity, but there are a few technical caveats. So how does one actually compute such a quantity? Well, for these cones in classical vector spaces, <laughs> we simply sit at the vertex of the cone and we put a Gaussian distribution of vectors around it. Then for every vector g, we compute something called its metric projection, where the metric projection of g onto c is the vector in the cone which is closest to g as measured by Euclidean distance. So you can think of it as the closest point on the cone, as it were, to g. Then what you can show is that this statistical dimension thing is simply the expected value of the two norm of this metric projection. Now, this is not the definition that Jonathan and Carl and I and, and Robin, I guess, have been working with, but one can go read uh, some very illuminating papers from roughly 2013, and you'll discover that this is actually an equivalent definition to the definition that is commonly encountered in terms of these so-called intrinsic volumes. So at this point, we've defined kind of cones in classical state space, cones in quantum state space. I've showed you how to compute the statistical dimension of a cone in the classical state space. So now we gotta go compute it for the quantum state space. And to do that, we basically wind back three slides and replace everything that's classical with something that's quantum. So suppose that I have a cone defined locally around some true state rho naught. Give myself a Gaussian distribution of vectors, which I will conveniently call rho hat, which are normally distributed <laughs> around that state rho naught with a covariance matrix proportional to the identity. Yes, Robin. Uh, you went back to test something kind of fast that uh -huh. left me roadkill. Um, you said, I've shown you how to compute the statistical dimension of the classical state space. Uh, Cones in the classical state space. What's the classical state space? Cla class real vector spaces, I should say. Are your quantum cones going to not be embedded in real vector they spaces? They will be embedded in real vector spaces. The, so what's the difference? Between the, the, the difference is really the fact that I want to identify the vertex of the cone in the quantum state space with some true state. I could have rewritten all of these slides in such a way that there was a one-to-one -one mapping, but then you guys probably would have been actually more confused than you are right now about why I'm doing what I'm doing. The cones in quantum state space are supposed to tell us something about local geometry of that state space. Just indeed as cones in real vector spaces, or as are canonically worked with, tell you something about its local geometry. But it's mostly, I want to identify the vertex of this cone with a true state. Another way of looking at what this assumption is or what this is, is it's simply the distribution of unconstrained maximum likelihood estimates under the assumption of local asymptotic normality. Once we have such vectors, what do we do? We have to project them back to the cone. So for every vector rho hat, we'll define its metric projection as simply the state, which is closest to rho hat inside the quantum state space as measured by the Hilbert-Schmidt distance. Again, this is the uh, maximum likelihood estimate under the assumption of local asymptotic normality and imposing positivity on the MLEs. So now that I have its metric, my metric projection, what do you think I'm gonna do? Well, I'm gonna compute some kind of uh, distance. And this is where Robin's question becomes particularly apropos because remember in the classical definition, I would have simply just computed the, um, the norm of this. But since all of these cones are defined with respect to some vertex that I'm specially identifying as a true state, I need to subtract off that true state here. So we'll take this as actually a definition of what the, the statistical dimension of a cone in quantum state space is. 
Elohim, I, I see the look on your face, and so therefore, I have to ask, is, is everything all right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is... This yeah, I, can is see, I can see that your, your rationality is biases, and, and then this can, can be generalized to having not, like, biases that are not the same. You, you, in fact, you could, and, and one thing that we'll come to at the end of the talk is studying how anisotropy in the Fisher information affects this quantity. But that's something that we really haven't tackled now. And really, if I argue this in reverse, we had initially, you know, three years ago, I was telling you people about heterodyne tomography and model selection. And then we said, well, this is really hard, so let's pick a simplifying assumption. And then it still took me a couple years to tell you about that. And then we wrote a paper about that. And then someone else said, well, go look over in this direction. And now we're looking over in that direction. But I assure you that one day, we shall in fact write a paper about optical tomography and model selection. And, and then maybe all of these things will come together in some sort of grand synthesis in that regard. So actually, this is a, a good point to just sort of take Can a small I breather. A yes. Um, this, this is why I have this slide, actually. Oh, <laughs> yeah. the times are right. Yeah. So were you worried in talking to him about the difference between emasculated and emasculated? <laughs> It's a probably simplex, you know the Gaussian distribution about it. There's no other estimate that you could make that is a vertex, right? Unless, I mean, you're nearby. What do you mean? Well, the, the vertex is isolated. All the other vertices are at other right. points. Right, right. Yeah. That's not true in quantum state space. Some of the estimates will be true space, and you won't have to project them back in. Sure. So how can you define this cone relative to the one state I, I do it by inserting this very wonderful regularization factor called epsilon. And then I'm going to let epsilon be as small as I absolutely needed to, so that way I don't have to deal with that question. I mean, we have a better answer, and I don't think that's a good answer. Okay. Maybe Robin has some, some uh, comment. It'll turn out that, you know, the projection is the same at all the different points, and so you can, so various measures you might introduce, like your average number of parameters for statistical distance, Dimension. make any difference relative to. So you, you will notice that in, in our, we, we, we do have to, we regularize by it, right? We inserted it here and we divided it here. So it is correctly normalized in that sense. Uh, Jonathan so, tells me what you should be using is a product cone. Yes, we should be using something that is called a product cone, but there's enough math in this talk that we're not going right. down that okay, road. I'm happy. Yes, Rob. I'm happy. Well, if Carl wasn't happy, <laughs> I was going to suggest that you flip back one more one slide. slide just, one. To, well, just one more. Okay. To show Carl the picture of of what he's talking Describing. about, right? Well, I paid attention to all the pictures. Good. That's why I'm <laughs> including a lot of pictures in this talk. Is so I think what I would say to us is that's still a cone, right? right. Sure is. There are other points nearby that are like the point that you started at. Right. So, so I, I like Robin's answer. I do like Jonathan's answer, where you use this product cone structure to mod out those degrees of freedom. Cone. What's his face? Anyway, go they, ahead. These are, these are equivalent ideas, actually, just different pictures. Jonathan's pictures are where you think about product cones. My pictures are where you don't. Okay. So I'm going to assume that Q&A for this section is over. Now, the point of this <laughs> was that although we hadn't set out to, Robin and I's paper actually computed this quantity accidentally. So if you start from the definition of this quantity that I presented on two slides ago, and then you invoke all of the assumptions in our paper about local asymptotic normality and positivity. You go from this, you basically replace this metric projection with rho hat MLE. And then if you go read the paper, you discover that this quantity is somehow related to this uh, log likelihood ratio statistic that I've been telling you about for a few years now. I'm not actually going to ever say what that statistic is, except that under the assumptions of our paper, it is equal to this. And the whole point of our paper was to actually provide uh, an approximation for this quantity. And Voila, right? So for, I kind of really like this aspect of my research because it goes to show you what happens when you go off and you search in some direction and you, for your own reasons, and then someone stops you and then they say, hey, go look over here. And you're like, oh, wow, I already, I already did that and, and I, have a, I have a result, right? I think that's kind of cool. So I want to take a couple of slides and actually walk you through some, some of the details, not all of the details of doing this calculation. Mostly what we realized was that 
uh, a good geometric way to think about this statistical dimension, quantity, was to break it apart into two pieces. So I start with my definition of the statistical dimension, and then I simply expand out the, the trace in, in some basis. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the terms in this sum, and I'm going to arrange them in a grid. And we're gonna see what they look like from some numerics. And so if you do that, you, you get a grid that looks like this. And if you stare at that grid long enough, and believe me, Robin and I have stared at these for a long time, you see that there, there are kind of two structures that you can identify in this grid. The first is this blue thing, which we've called an L, and then there's this orange thing, which we've called a kite. So L and kite. And so we're gonna break apart the statistical dimension into these two pieces and consider them separately and see what they tell us about average number of parameters. So let's make that distinction. So all of the, the elements in this L have a, this expected value equal to one. And so therefore the statistical dimension of this L simply counts how many parameters are there in the L. So that's one intuition that says this statistical dimension thing is doing some kind of effective parameter counting. Every parameter, every matrix element of my estimate that maps to a location in the L in this grid uh, is kind of a, a real fully fluctuating, fully contributing parameter to the statistical dimension. The cute thing is that if you look at the, the numbers in the kite and you take their sum, their sum is not necessarily equal to the number of elements inside the kite itself. These numbers actually quantify sort of an effective number of parameters for what Jonathan and Carl would call the reduced cum. And this is kind of where it makes state tomography as a problem be really interesting. Parameters in the L can be seen as representing sort of unitary fluctuations of my estimator away from the true state. They don't experience the positivity effect. Elements in the kite, however, they represent kind of spectral fluctuations into and out of the state space. And therefore, they will be constrained when I impose that my, my estimates be positive. And so it's imposing this positivity constraint that reduces the number of parameters from just your naive parameter counting of d squared minus one to an effective number of parameters given by this statistical dimension. So for qubits, we can actually compute all these quantities exactly. So let's take the self-same picture that I, that I had a little bit earlier, but now we're, we're gonna think of it like a sphere. So if my, my true state is a pure state in the qubit state space, then the corresponding statistical dimension of its cone is two and a half. It's not three as you would expect, but it's also not just two, is that right? Yeah, two as you would expect from assuming that your estimates are pure. It's somewhere in between. If my true state was somewhere located in the bulk, then its statistical dimension is three. So one way of interpreting this is that when I'm doing inference of a state that is in the bulk of the state space that I'm considering, then the, the effective number of parameters that I'll need to specify in order to describe that state is gonna be three. On the other hand, if my state is pure, the effective number of parameters is two and a half. This is kind of like a compressed sensing result in the sense that if you have fewer parameters that you actually have to specify, then you might not need as many resources you know, or measurement outcomes in order to um, estimate them accurately. Now, I can't draw higher dimensional state spaces, so basically I'm just gonna throw some math at you. So if we take a high dimensional limit in which we assume that the dimension of the Hilbert space goes to infinity, but that the rank of my true state is, uh, is small compared to that, then you get this asymptotic result from our paper. Now, admittedly, I push back against throwing up math on slides because I see how you guys look, and uh, I also look like that when I see math on slides, but Robin uh, exhorted me to put up some math to demonstrate to you people that I know how to do math. We have done math. Adrian, what? You didn't say anything? Oh, Andy, yeah. Do you believe me, can I do math? Thank you, there we go, okay. So the statistical dimension of a cone in quantum, of these cones in quantum state space depends upon the ambient Hilbert space dimension D and the rank of the true state R. Right? And there's some complicated expressions that you also have to, well complicated looking expressions that you need to know. So as I said in the paper, this is uh, derived through a series of approximations. And so I'd like to show you that actually this formula that we've derived kind of does accurately model numerical results that we've been studying. So, yes, Gene? Uh, does uh, R, P, K, D, how do you uh, divide the L and the kite? 
It does, actually, right? So um, basically, you can think of the L as all of the matrix elements in your estimate, which are unitarily coherent with the true state. And so as the rank of the true state goes up, then the number of elements in that L actually gets bigger. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Could, could you, uh, so uh, I now realize that the chi and the L is the same argument about product cones and cones. Exactly, it is product cones yeah. and not product cones. And they're all cones. And they're all cones, and it's all the way down, cones. yeah. Uh, but could you tell us in the qubit types, or maybe you did tell us <coughs> Sure. So I will go back one slide. I mean, there's only one case of matrix. The, the, the top one is the only one of matrix, right? So in that case, the L is going to represent sort of unitary rotations on the surface of the sphere, and the kite is going to represent a, a sigma z type component into an out of. And the kite's a half. The kite is a half. Yeah. So exactly. that's where the thing gets curious because you're going in one direction, the ends of the L. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Or phrase another way. In this case, you, you have a product cone such that the reduced cone is just the, the, the space defined by um, the, the real line, but constrained to be positive. Mm -hmm. that's, yep. that's the cone that you get. Yeah. Okay. So we have this formula. It looks somewhat complicated, but you know, it's trackable. So how does it do in actually predicting numerical results? Well, step one when you have a formula like this is you might want to check whether or not it, it satisfies some kind of naive bounds that you might otherwise expect. So we're going to look at a series of these plots. On the x-axis, we're going to plot the Hilbert space dimension. On the y-axis, we're going to plot statistical dimension of cones. If every estimate that my uh, maximum likelihood returned was a pure state, then I would only need 2 times d minus 1 real numbers to describe that estimate. On the other hand, if my estimator always returned a maximally mixed state, then I would need d squared minus 1 real numbers to describe it. So hopefully, these should define some bounds that, that, uh, that our theory should respect. And so if you take our formula and you just you know, plot it, remember it depends upon the rank of the true state, and so therefore we have to have all these nice multicolored lines in order to capture that. Low rank true states are these lines down here, and higher rank true states are these lines up here. Now, if you look at this plot, you might see a problem. The fact that our theory predicts that the statistical dimension of these cones should exceed the naive parameter counting argument this is a nice upper bound. Your theory shouldn't go above it. Admittedly, you could solve this by saying our model is if the number that our theory predicts is bigger than d squared minus 1, return d squared minus 1. Less facetiously, um, our model and results were derived in an asymptotic limit. And that limit actually starts to break down once the rank of the true state becomes comparable to the ambient Hilbert space dimension, where here comparable means within a factor of 2 or so. Okay? So that's why these lines. You know, if you try and evaluate our formula like right here, you discover that what it'll return is NAM. So it's a clear sign that, that something has gone wrong and, and that's not working. But if you look at the numerical results, oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Especially, especially if you just look down here for the low rank true states. Then you see that our numerical results shown here in the dots lie very nicely on, on the line for our theory. However, as the rank of the true state goes up, you know, so for instance, this set of purple dots up here actually maps to a theory that starts up there. So that, that doesn't quite work so well. But we know why that is. is because here, the rank of the true state is 10, and we're only considering Hilbert space dimensions that are like 20. And that's order two, and so therefore we just say, well, the theory breaks down <coughs> in that kind of regime. But if you look at the regime where the rank of the true state is small compared to the Hilbert space dimension, then you actually, you know, the theory and the numerics agree nicely. So with that, kind of what I've shown you is that we have this statistical dimension quantity. It somehow captures an effective number of parameters in a local region of the quantum state space. And that this might tell us something about the average number of parameters necessary for maximum likelihood inference. It provides a complementary aspect to what Ivan and uh, Charlie and Amir have done by suggesting that the local geometry of quantum state space also provides additional constraints in helping beat back the number of parameters that you have to fit. And so at this point, you might say, oh, you know, great. This is super wonderful. Where are the conclusions? Remember how I said that this statistical dimension is kind of like the number of parameters in maximum likelihood? I'd like to take a little bit of time to show you some recent stuff Robin and I have been thinking about in order to understand why the statistical dimension doesn't quite uh, encapsulate that quantity. The reason for this is that the statistical dimension captures geometrical and not topological properties of the local state space. 
So because the statistical dimension is an expected value, I can use the so-called law of total expectation to rewrite it in this form. Basically, I'm gonna partition the quantum state space in the following way. What is the rank of the maximum likelihood estimate? So that's what this sum over r is going to do. And so the law of total expectation says that this equivalence is, is totally fine. What we're gonna do is we're gonna try and understand the pieces on the right-hand side, because we already understand the quantity on the left. Now, Jonathan and Carl had been working on computing probabilities of, of maximum likelihood estimates being certain ranks. Uh, those calculations are very long. John, Jonathan is now an integral master, uh, but, well, you're better than I, okay? Just go ahead and say, you think we're wasting our time. I don't think you're wasting your time. I hope that you will derive analytical results for these things. We can't, Robin and I cannot calculate these analytically, so we're gonna simulate them, okay? And we're gonna think about, well, what is this quantity, this delta of C given R? We're calling this the conditional statistical dimension because it is conditioned on the rank of the MLE. And so if you thought that the statistical dimension was something that was topological about the state space, well then you just go look at Jonathan, or actually Jonathan just looked at me and he said, well Travis, gosh, this thing has just gotta be this quantity here. Because that's the dimension of the manifold of rank, even Carl, even Carl, you look at him right back there, he's, he's doing his thing, right? So let's actually plug these two things in, you know, numerics, analytics, and see what we get out. I, we're gonna compare the sum on the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So let's do that. So we have uh, the quantity that we understand, the left-hand side. We have the quantity on the right-hand side, which is a theory kind of discussing how this statistical dimension might be related to topological properties. And what do you notice? Well, you notice that our theory results are kind of consistently higher than the actual numerics that we observe. And when I saw this, I was a little bit scared because it, it suggests that we weren't really understanding something about what this statistical dimension is telling us. And you can go even further. Let's just look at these quantities. Uh, I finally figured out how to calculate these numerically, so let's just plot these against our theory. And what do you find? Uh, you again find that the numerics and the theory, they don't agree. And this was really disquieting. Like, as of two weeks ago or three weeks ago, this was, this was the most disquieting thing I had ever encountered in my life here to date. But thankfully, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, we have a reason why. It's because boundaries in quantum state space are actually curved. And thankfully, I don't have to kind of grind through a whole bunch of high dimensional quantum state spaces in order to illustrate to this to you. I'm gonna do something that's much similar, although not seasonally appropriate. I'm gonna talk about ice cream cones, okay? So here's what is called a circular cone in R3. I will think about its statistical dimension. I will partition this cone into three pieces. The very pointy vertex, the very crunchy surface of the cone, and the ice cream interior. That is a full and complete partition of this cone, and so therefore from the law of total expectation, I can make this equivalence. The particular conditional statistical dimension we're gonna be interested in looking at is this one. What is the statistical dimension conditioned on my um, maximum likelihood estimate being on the surface of the cone? Now, here's the question. If this number was a topological property of this surface, what do you think it should be? Anybody? Two, right? Because you're like, God, the surface of the cone, that's, that's a two-dimensional thing, right? And what's more, that all uh, ice cream cones, the really long skinny ones or the super wide fat ones, all have a surface whose dimension is, is two, right? So therefore, this number shouldn't depend upon the so-called opening angle of the cone. Well, if you do some numerics, you find that you're just wrong. You find that one, it does depend upon the opening angle, and it interpolates between one and two. Like, ah, oh, this is really awkward. This, is not, this number is not a topological property of the surface of the cone, it's a geometrical one. Now, if you sit down and think about this some more, you realize that you have to return all the way back to one of the original definitions of the statistical dimension, which I haven't told you in this talk. And what you realize is that this number relates to the so-called um, polyhedral approximations to these cones. I know you're like, oh God, think about it this way. On the surface of the cone, I could define a triangular mesh, right? I could replace the nice smooth surface with just a whole bunch of triangles, right? And tessellate them around the cone, okay? Or squares for that matter. Or squares, but I'm gonna use triangles because uh, I'm biased like that, I guess. Waffling. 
for each polyhedral approximation, you could run through the analysis that we did earlier in the talk with the Gaussian distribution and projecting it back onto the approximations. And these Vs are the probabilities that you end up on various k-dimensional faces of that approximation. So for instance, V1 would be, what is the probability that I end up on one of these edges of the triangular approximation? And V2 is, what is the probability that I end up on the inside? Now consider taking the limit as I make this, this triangular mesh finer and finer and finer. Well, you kind of say, well, geez, it doesn't really look like this surface has any one-dimensional faces to it, right? It's a two-dimensional thing. But this first intrinsic volume doesn't go to zero as you take that limit. And that's the subtle point that we hadn't appreciated, was that buried inside these kinds of smooth surfaces, there are these k-dimensional faces that you actually have to think about, and that these conditional statistical dimensions are related to linear combinations of them. So now we have actually reached kind of the end. Um, yeah, I'm gonna tell you about some conclusions. Mostly the last section was for Carl and Robin and, and Jonathan and, and Ivan and whatnot, and it, or anyone else that really likes to think about putting triangular approximations on ice cream cones. <laughs> so with that, let me show you some things that we'd like to work on going forward. So one thing is to understand what the heck these conditional statistical dimensions are. Right? I said that somehow they have to be related to linear combinations of these so-called intrinsic volumes. And indeed, Jonathan and I had made some progress in that regard, and then we realized that actually the problem is much more subtle than we had imagined, and we're still beating our heads against that one. As mentioned by Chi, the, the size of this L depends upon the rank of the true state. And Robin and I's results are derived in a limit where this kite and its size is much bigger than the rank of the true state. And so that's what gave rise to those theory curves that just kind of plunge off into sort of the ether. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to figure out if there are any techniques we could use to actually bridge the gap. If we could consider cases where the size of this kite becomes comparable to the rank of the true state. In terms of quantum compressed sensing, we had discussed the, the paper by David Gross et al. And I've talked with you over the past couple weeks about how people in convex planes of the optimization problem to bound the number of measurements that they need to do in their random sampling matrices. And so one thing that we'd like to think about is, well, could we derive a similar result for the statistical dimension of such cones? And that would kind of provide some complementary aspects to what Ivan and Charlie and Amir did today. And then, as mentioned by uh, Elohim, and <coughs> as sort of pointed out by Carl, I guess, putting it nicely, fissure informations are rarely ever isotropic. And so understanding how anisotropy in the fissure information changes the behavior of the statistical dimension would actually then kind of move us toward talking about uh, maybe a tomographic regime that is actually experimentally relevant. Because right now, we're sort of off in theory land making assumptions which are tractable, but not necessarily corresponding to anything that actually occurs in the lab. So what we should take away from all of this work is that the geometry of state space affects the resource requirements of maximum likelihood, in part because it affects the average number of parameters that you'll need to specify a maximum likelihood estimate. Now, we're still kind of figuring out how exactly that's the case, but I think computing this statistical dimension thing is a good place to start. And so in pictures, what we've been doing is zooming in on the quantum state space and discovering these cones, and we've been computing their statistical dimensions since that tells us something about the local geometry of that cone. And we like to understand how this statistical dimension sort of, kind of, relates to average number of parameters in maximum likelihood estimates. Now, thankfully, we don't have to go back to the drawing board because we already have a formula that agrees very well with numerics. And so now we can kind of use that as a, a foundation upon which to leap forward and do additional research. So with that, I will thank you for your kind attention and I'll take any questions you might have. So thanks for checking out that video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was really fun to discuss my research with my dissertation committee, and I got some really good feedback and suggestions from them about the talk itself, as well as future avenues of research that I could do. I'll leave a link to the slide deck in the video description, so that way you can go check those out on your own. If you have comments or questions about the work that was presented in this talk, feel free to let me know. And as always, if you have ideas about kinds of content you'd like to see me produce, leave a comment, send me an email, or tweet at me.
Thanks very much.